what are the best imaging and other laboratory studies that you want in terms of knowing what's going on and, pres and prescribing the right antibiotics? Um, what are the, what's the best stuff? You know, I think the best thing is having a seasoned clinician who can look at the patient and make a decision in regards to whether or not they really think that person's infected. Wait, did I just hear you say a doctor is a good thing to have? I, I think a doctor is a good thing, but it depends in part on the doctor <laughs> and the pressures that they're facing. Uh, you know, we, we can talk about tests and how in patients who are on a ventilator, sure, if we get a BAL, it might be better than a non-BAL specimen. A quantitative culture might be better in terms of helping with decisions regarding treatment. But I think that uh, too often what ends up happening in the average ICU is that the trigger is a very simple one to pull on antibiotics. And it just gets done frequently. And because we have certain drugs that are not restricted, they're the ones that get thrown in there. And then we run right. into what Andy was referring to. It may not be the right drug for that patient. Okay. They may have a drug-resistant organism. And now you're not treating them correctly, and their risk of death is higher. So here's what comes back, all right? You, you have a patient with pneumonia. It may or may not be resistant, may or may not be pseudomonas. So you send off a BAL, you send off a culture. First thing you're going to get back is what? You're going to get a, a gram stain. How long does the gram stain take in your hospital? Well, it depends. Well, um, <clears throat> I know that, but well, how long it, it is it? I, I think, well, I, I, I don't know. Well, so you know, we make a lot of progress with that. You know, we relied on cultures and gram stains for a very long period of time. We become more and more, pro we, re we realize that real-time diagnostics are really important. We just highlighted the fact that it's really hard to guess. And you guess one resistance, and you get another resistance, and the patient may be paying the price. And so you need more accurate guidance early. And so we are using more and more PCR-based and other technologies that are not, that do not rely on cultures. And so, gram stain, so, but, but I would take it one step backwards. First of all, it's important to have the right specimen. And it's important to have a system. So how often do you see that patients have been on antibiotics without any culture being taken? So you talk about being aggressive with antibiotics upfront in a patient who would benefit from early aggressive antibiotic management. I would say you should be just as aggressive in collecting information that will allow you to correct or de-escalate therapy oh, wait. down the who, and so I'm sorry, did you just say people are on antibiotics without cultures? Every day in this country. Where? All over. All over. Most of it, the patients. Pardon me, is that just this side of insane? Or am I wrong? It, it's appalling. Appalling is this side of insane. Yeah. Maybe it's the other side of insane. Uh, it, it, no, but it, <laughs> depends it which happens. Side. People, people routinely pull the trigger on antibiotics without thinking about what are the tools necessary to actually de-escalate, stop, or whatever. Right. It's also escalate, too. So Maybe that's let's, the truth. You know, that's I didn't realize we'd have to go back to step one. Number one, you're going to start antibiotics. Get a culture first, if you can. Number two, you're going to get your gram stain, right? Number three, you want your PCRs. How, how quickly do the PCRs come back? So, so again, we don't have, so we use a respiratory panel, and, and it mostly has respiratory viruses and a few bacteria, but not the bacteria type of Pseudomonas and others. Um, I guess that we will get into that in the future. We do use PCRs for blood cultures, for example. Okay. And so for those, <clears throat> we get the results usually a few hours after we get, few I mean, hours. For, for a few hours after the, the start of incubation. So we definitely, so, it's not immediately, but we de the time, you know, it, we used to have traditional first line, which is empiric, and then we had culture-guided or gram stain guided therapies. And, sure. and so I think that this period of time is getting shorter and shorter. And, and, but the point is that you talk about the fact that many patients don't have cultures. Many hospitals don't have molecular diagnostics as well. And if you look at the CDC recommendations for stewardship, for example, uh, one, of the, one of the points that they make is that if you want to use less antibiotics and more neurospectrum antibiotics and the right antibiotics, you need to know what you treat. And you need to know what you treat early, and you better use them. But we are, but I must say that this is an exciting period of time because for many, many years, Years since Pasteur, I'm sorry, and even before, um, you know, we've been relying on cultures, and now we have better diagnostics, and we know there are downsides to those rapid diagnostics as well, because as you know, PCRs can be too sensitive. And as Marin said, at the end of the day, the ability of the physician to interpret the results within the context of the patient, it's always the context of the patient that should determine what cultures and what tests you send, and how do you interpret them, and how aggressive you are. Okay, so you get the PCRs back within a few hours. How long typically does it take to get a good culture back? In other words, I, my resident says we sent the cultures and I now know this is pseudomonas. How long does that take? Well, I must say, uh, just uh, again, to, uh, 
to this point, the time to cultures has not changed. You know, when you rely on bacteria to divide, this has not changed in a long period of time. And the first thing that you're going to get is the gram stain. But I, as an infectious, maybe I shouldn't say that in this form, but anyways, because oh, it's kind ahead. of revealing one, of the, it's one, of, the, one of the secrets of the, of, the, um, of the, you know, and I embarrass my fellows very often by doing that. Did you go when to the micro lab and scoop I call them? the micro lab. You do that, the, don't because you? The micro, oh, I go to the micro lab because the micro lab says gram negative in the sputum or gram negative in the blood, but when you talk to the micro lab, they'll give you the description of the, of the microbe, and if you ask them what do you think it is, they'll tell you, I think this is this, but because this is a gas, they're not going to put it right. down. Or and I'm seeing sheets amazed. of stuff, you know. But, but they, and, and very often they know very early, before the, sometimes a day before the culture results. Right. And this can, you know, if the gram negative is a coliform that should be treated with a carbapenem, or it's a more pseudomonas that should be treated with the third generation cephalosporin or what have you, they can give you this very early. And there is less and less communication with the microlab. And I would say use your microlab. Talk to your microbiologists, and even if it's off-site, give them a call. They'll be happy to know that they can help you uh, treat a patient. They'll be happy to know that there's actually value to what they do. But I think the other point to realize is that um, knowing the pathogen doesn't give you the crucial piece of information, which is the actual susceptibility data. Right. And one of the flaws or one of the limitations of some of the rapid diagnostics that are coming online right now, not all, but some, is that they can tell you, well, Pseudomonas is present. Well, it doesn't tell you what it's susceptible to. Now you're still guessing. And you can go with your best guess, right, in terms of, well, 80% of my pseudomonas are susceptible to this, so I'm going to go with this. Uh, conversely, however, uh, the rapid diagnostics that will eventually get to susceptibility, I'd rather know what the organism is susceptible to, not necessarily what it's called, pseudomonas, enterobacteriaceae, whatever. But the other issue with the number of the rapid diagnostics is that we've alluded to, if all you do is send cultures when they're not indicated on colonized and not infected patients, and it finds something, you still have to interpret whether it's a colonizer or, a, or actual pathogen. And there's a lot of hope that rapid diagnostics are this technology that will engineer us out of the clinical judgment piece. And I actually think it's gonna make the clinical judgment piece more challenging. 